All right. Good evening, everybody. We are meeting with the awesome Dave Hickey, who has been a key figure in the art world for well over a decade. Um, <laughs> so, well, five decades. So how did, how did you get involved in this art world racket? Where, where did you start out? Where did you go to college? How did the art world seep into your blood? Uh, well, I grew up in Fort Worth, Texas, which is uh, has a great many great collectors. So I grew up around art collections and I grew up around with uh, artists of my childhood, with people like uh, uh, Grace Hartigan and Milton Resnick and uh, what's her name? Yeah, all those people. There you and, go. Uh, and so uh, I was fairly comfortable with it. and. Uh, and I had a lot of very good experiences in the homes of my friends and relations. And uh, I'm kind of, I'm an art person. And uh, I didn't start writing art. In college, I studied theoretical linguistics because I am, before I'm an art person, a writer. And so I, uh, but I started writing actually when my friend Terry Allen asked me to write something for a catalog. And I thought that was cool. And uh, then I got a lot of other offers. And I opened a gallery in Texas in about 65 and uh, showed a lot of good artists. And uh, I enjoyed being a dealer. Uh, I went to New York and ran a gallery in Soho. And uh, then I was a private dealer. And then I took a job as the uh, executive editor of Art in America. This is when I'm about 26. And um, I uh, didn't like uh, working for people in a gallery, and I didn't like working for people in a uh, at the magazine. And they fired me for cutting up lines of cocaine on my desk up there in the uh, Whitney Towers. They didn't mind the cocaine. They hated the little scratches on their desk. <laughs> but um, they were... Uh, so I, I just I started writing for magazines, and I started writing for art magazines, but I wrote a lot about rock and roll and uh, lived in Nashville for a while, uh, played in a band, did everything you were supposed to do if you're an irresponsible uh, white male at that time so um i uh and i've always just been a writer I, I take the work that comes i don't seek out work uh i i if i seek out anything i seek out editors who will give me interesting assignments because i really uh it's all good. It doesn't matter what i'm writing about it's still going to be me you know and i could write about add Reinhardt or the dining room table and it would still be whatever I want to say. So, uh, and I, I enjoy the challenge of art. I was educated in the late sixties in French post in French structuralism. And I still owe a great debt to that world. And, uh, so that's, uh, and I've just been writing, uh, most of my life, occasionally I've taught school, occasionally I've done all sorts of things, but uh, I'm just a writer. I get an assignment, if it's worth it, I write it. We've been whining about the art world going on a hundred years. Um, what the fuck's wrong with it? Hmm. Nothing for nearly everybody. Uh, in my view, it's too big. It's, in my view, there's no price support for buying young artists. Uh, there's no intellectual constituency of people who are who are having a, their say about young artists. So it's all pure market. And uh, I guess that's fine. Uh, it's just not a world in which I am very comfortable. And I always tell artists, there's only three questions. Where do you want to live? How do you want to live? What do you want it to look like? And that's about it. And so uh, uh, the art world today is just not a place I want to live. But how much has it changed since 1965 in Austin? Oh, well, uh, 
1965, they were like serious people. Uh, in 1965, there were maybe three graduate schools of art in the entire country. Uh, let me see, it was Yale, uh, Chenard, Kansas City, one or two others. Uh, there was no, there were no professors writing in this world, which meant that magazines had to pay you, whereas professors are always interested in getting tenure, so they will work for nothing, so professional writers like myself can't do it. You what know? about, all right, but you bring up an interesting point. What about the influence of art schools? How has that impacted the art world? Has that been a beneficial influence? I mean, the artists talk right. about the, whether or not they should go to art school. Do we even want art schools? Have they been good? I mean, you've worked no. for them, they've paid your bills. Yeah, I know, but at the same time, and I have had the gift of many good students, but I just don't think you could, I think it just delays your adulthood. Uh, if you go to a school with artists that you respect, you could go to UCLA, let's say, if you're in with Charlie Ray, and uh, you would probably never see Charlie, but at least you would have a good peer group of other people who wanted to meet Charlie Ray. And, uh, and except for meeting people I, and, and forming a peer group, I can't imagine any positive function that comes out of graduate school. I, I've taught critical, uh, I've taught theory courses for off and on for 25 years. Uh, I can assure you that most of my colleagues say they teach theory, but they don't. They preach theory, which is mind numbing and not right, you know. That's a really I, good point. If I like Foucault, I'll tell you what I like, but I'll also tell you where he's crazy. And uh, that just doesn't go on in American graduate schools. And so I'd, I would just dispense with them, really. Uh, when I opened my gallery in Texas, I think Peter Plagans was the only artist I showed who uh, had been to graduate school. He'd been to Syracuse. But everybody else were just undergraduates and people in the world. Yeah, it doesn't tend to matter matter that much, right? So back 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 to the the big the bigger picture. Um, I mean, are, are graduate schools part of the problem? Yes, of course. And how do we fix the problem? Well, we could um, actually teach art history, which we don't. Uh, we could teach skills if we wanted to. Uh, we could teach you how to do an 18th century drawing. We could teach you a whole lot of things, but education is essentially conservative activity. Uh, it doesn't teach you the future. It doesn't teach you the present. It sort of brings you up to date, you know? So you no, know where Piero della Francesca lived, you know? And, but that doesn't get done because educational standards have plummeted. I've uh, sat in the hundreds of faculty members at hundreds of schools, some very good, some very bad. I have never seen a department hire anybody who was better than the rest of the department. Do you understand? You're I'll not going to hire a star. You're going to hire somebody you can push around. And this is universal. So year after year, the quality of professors goes down. Yeah, like a root. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. So, what about the what about the other facets of the art world? How guilty are the auction houses? Are the is, is oh, the I, I, I think you know how guilty is Goldman Sachs? I mean, any other sort of black box industry where you don't know what goes in and you don't know what comes out and you don't know what the price means, you don't know how much it was leveraged, how much it was paid away. You don't know anything about the prices. Uh, they're irrelevant to me. Uh, so you see a parallel between society and the art world? I guess so. Yeah, well, the art world is part of society. Uh, I don't think... Uh, yeah, but maybe, maybe in the 60s and then there was more disconnect or there was more separation between the art world and society at large. 
Well, of course, because everybody in the 60s, myself included, hated fucking America. And I still hate it. It's a terrible, sexist, racist place to live. Yeah, and, but it's and, better than, yeah, but unfortunately, it's better than all the other choices. Uh, yes, it is, but it doesn't mean you have to go Googling around trying to get your ass in the mainstream. Uh, okay. That's what the underground was about, was about not being in the mainstream. We weren't looking to get in. We were looking to get out. And so uh, that was, and then, you know, the underground died for reasons I could go on about, but. Uh, it had to, that was going to happen in regard, I mean, regardless. Um, uh, the difference in the sixties art world is first, nobody had benefits. Nobody had a teaching job. Nobody had a job that you could quite figure out. Uh, Ralph Ricke, the great German dealer and I, became art dealers because we'd been hanging out in New York telling people we were art dealers because we had to tell them we were something. <laughs> so we just sort of drifted into it. But, um, but this is an art world of say 6,000 people, max. 6,000 people. It was a one step network. There was no outreach. There was no inflow. You signed up and you walked into Max's and there you were. And so, uh, and there was no particular reason to become an artist. You know, uh, it didn't pay very well. The only good thing about Max's is that it had an elevator to the penthouse. So you can hang out at the bottom and hang out with the top and avoid the middle altogether. And that was a great virtue of that scene. Um, you know, and in other words, now we're rolling into the mainstream. We're creating middle-class communitizing activities. We've gone into the sociability of a world that should and was antisocial. And, uh, so it's just not of much interest to me, you know. Is the, it reaching risk, a broader audience? Huh? Isn't it reaching a broader audience? Yeah, but I'm an art critic. I mean, what could that possibly mean to me? If the adulation of idiots can only hurt me, do you understand? If a lot of stupid people like what I write, I'm done. Do you understand? I mean, it's it's not about fame. You know, it's about being right. Yeah, but I'm not dealing so much, and maybe I should be, but I'm not dealing so much with you. I'm dealing more with it. I understand. And and we and I can get to you, but I mean I see I, I'm not I'm trying to play the devil's advocate a bit here, and I'm you know and you and I tend to agree a fair amount, right? Um, and I I think what's going on in the art world resembles reality TV to a fair extent, and you know the the dumbing down and the you know throwing money at things and attaching high prices and losing the integrity and soul of the art. I mean, I, I think that's all pretty clear and I would like to see it. I mean, I think that still happens in a microcosm. And I think the thing that we get guilty of too often perhaps is not acknowledging all the different art villages and that we can find, you know, comfort in, in, in various of the art villages and find the intellectual pursuit or the connoisseurship that we seek. Well, maybe so. I have some, some of my peers are my friends, but I don't have very many friends. And uh, until one of them dies, I don't need another. Um, <laughs> my, uh, <clears throat> my feeling about, about the broader art market is if it was that easy, if it's that easy that millions of people can understand it, I don't want to do it. Do you understand? I do yeah. difficulty, and uh, and I'm a snob, and I'm an elitist, and that's okay, you know, if it gets work. And uh, I do not see, I see the social consequences of art very clearly. I do not see the social praxis, praxis doing anything beyond just getting a bunch of people in a room to drink bad wine out of plastic cups, you know? So I am, um, but let me give you an example. In the art world that I grew up in, there were celebrities by the ton. 
you'd be at an opening, though, there would be David Bowie, there would be Bob Dylan, there would be uh, uh, Dennis Hopper, all of these people. Nobody fucking had a baby about it. You know, and Jay-Z shows up at pace and the world stops. I mean, I, it, it seems like we've, you know, it was nice to have celebrity people around. They always had good drugs, but I couldn't see any possible virtue of being friends with a celebrity. You know what I mean? I write about celebrities. I know who they are. <laughs> so. Okay. So, I don't know. I'm, t- I'm trying to figure out two things. Is, you know, what, do we, what do we say to young artists? What do we say to artists who are not making a career of it yet or who seek to? What do we tell them? Go away, turn around, road yeah. closed. Why not? It's not supposed to be easy, you know, and it's, and it's not free and uh, to help with them. Um, I am not an evangelist about the art world. In all of the great courses offered by American Life, the art, art is not a required course. It's an elective. And if you come, you know, it's not, it's, it's not going to make you feel better. It's not going to make you be better. It's not going to make you much richer. It's not going to do basically anything for it unless you like art. And so I simply do not see the benefit. But uh, of? I don't see the benefits of becoming an artist. I mean, an art, being an artist doesn't mean anything anymore. It means you belong to the Houston Artist Coalition or something like that. Yeah, but I don't think most of these folks are choosing to be an artist. I'm not convinced you chose to be an, a, a critic. No, I'm not a critic. I'm basically a theorist, but um, I write criticism. Okay, the and, theorist part you chose to do. I'm pretty good with that. Um, right. But regardless, um, so what does an artist do today? Well, in my experience, every generation of artists has to develop a new hustle. Now, if the guy that was on before talking about the internet were there, I would never recommend a person to do anything like that. I was an art dealer for nearly 10 years. And I just know one thing, you sell real physical works of art to real physical people. And otherwise you can't trust them. Your idea is not to get any buyer, it's get the best buyer. And that's your job if you're a dealer, is to get the best buyer. You know, uh, uh, Ivan Karp's great tragedy when he thought that photorealism was the next big thing. It turned out it was just the kind of painting that you could sell to farmers in Nebraska. And so uh, he sold a whole lot of art but it had absolutely no historical or intellectual consequence. So I don't think, uh, you know, I mean, I'm not in this to teach about art and I'm not in it to evangelize about art. I I know this world fairly well. I stay as far away from it as I can. I have, you know, I have ways of dealing with things. (laughs) So, uh, even this is a little too cozy. <laughs> Fair enough. All right, you, you t- let's open this up for questions. If you guys have questions, raise your hand. You <clears throat> said earlier today something about a book you're working on. Tell me more. Oh, I'm doing a book called 25 Women Essays on Their Art. Uh, I've written about a whole lot of artists over the years, of course. And uh, oh, it's Thank you about trying to do something for my friend, Marsha Tucker, who died recently. So I found uh, discounting reviews that I had about uh, 25 essays on women artists. And then I went online and looked around and there weren't any books with 25 essays on the work of women artists. There was a lot about menopause. There was a lot about, uh, uh, you know, sexual attacks. There was a lot about how we age. There was nothing about the actual work of women artists. I said, what the hell? That's a wedge, you know. And also, I like 
writing about women artists because the the conditions are are so different than dealing with guys. With guys, uh, uh, you're either a well, there's always a testosterone thing with guys, and um, and it's always an issue of who's going to win. <laughs> so, uh, but I have a so I'm I'm working on the final draft of 25 women, and uh, and I have a number of books in progress. I have a second volume of Bear Guitar. It's called. Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, I forgot what it's called. Um, that was a great title. Uh huh. Air guitar. Yes, yeah. it was. And um, I drew very good titles, and it falls off from there. <laughs> so, Pete Volkus said, "If you can't make great art, at least have great titles." <laughs> that's right. Well, I I really believe in that. And Pete made great art. His titles weren't that great. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much true. Hey, Sarah, you have a question. Um, go ahead. Wow. Hi, Dave Hickey. Amazing. Thank you so much for meeting with us. Right. Uh, so ask him to autograph your book right here. Is that what you're right. doing? Am yeah. I talking to Sarah? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Um, Hi. Actually, I, I do want to talk about your book. When I was in college um, in the late 90s, we all marched around with air guitar. It was <laughs> my, it was the Bible. Um, I have my copy. It's right here. I have my date. 1999 and I was just kind of going through it and looking through all of the things that I underlined and you know I don't know I'm listening to you now and I I feel like a little sad and I I remember back in the day feeling so inspired by the book and and I don't know right now after listening I feel like I should break my brushes um I'm uh. an <laughs> I'm an educator. I'm an, I'm a teacher. Um, I teach at the San Francisco Art Institute. Um, I'm trying to get out of there and go somewhere else, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm passionate about that. And I, and I, I agree with you. I do think that, um, that the best people aren't hired. Um, but I, I don't want to give up. Should I just give up? What do I do? Well, you don't want to take Aqua as a role model. That's one thing. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I think uh, now. Let me. Uh, what I have to say about teaching is this: Yes, I love teaching. I had wonderful students. Universities are the most terrible places in the world, and I've taught at some very good ones. They are not civilized. They have family values. They are not intellectual. Their total exercises in low-grade personal narcissism. And uh, that is, you go into class and you get uncritical attention from a bunch of children. And uh, then you go home and watch TV because what you wanted from art, you're getting in the classroom, that little bounce of recognition. And so you're eroding your energy to make art every time you get all that attention from a student. And so I didn't come to teaching until I was very disciplined. And I learned to get up at 3.30 in the morning and write till 9. And then I was reminded that I was teaching school or doing some dumb job. But if I could get those hours in, I could continue to write. And that's just discipline, you know. Um, I don't think, uh, I, yeah, there's, um, uh, I thought Pirates and Farmers was, a, I mean, uh, Air Guitar was a fairly upbeat book. and. Uh, I think the 25 women book will be an upbeat book because the artists are very strange and the work is good. Uh, the last book I had out, Pirates and Farmers, it's not quite such a happy trip, but uh, I felt like it needed to be taken. Uh, so what can I tell you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess, I don't know. I guess I'm, I feel... I mean, I definitely have discipline. I, I make a lot of work. And in fact, it was, I call Paul my art coach. And even he told me I need to get out of my studio. Um, and, um, <laughs> you know, I... be an artist if you have to get out of your studio. Well, I mean, meaning that, you know, to kind of get out and do the other parts of what you have to do when you're an artist. But, 
I, I believe in, 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 in giving back and I, I want to be a good professor. And I think mm. that, I don't think that it's completely lost. I mean, maybe it will be because maybe I'll never get that full-time position that I hope that I get. And it's, you know, I don't know. And, and it will be replaced by the mediocre. I don't know, but. Yeah, that's, that's the way it goes. Uh, the, the problem is, is that if you teach at a school, even uh, SFAI or you know, any of those schools, and they say, well, you only have to work six hours a week. They don't tell you that you have to get up there at 8.30 to get a parking place and you can't go home or leave the campus until 6.30. And so you have just wasted 10 hours teaching six hours. And so that's not a very good deal. I mean, universities are invented to waste your time and to go to the, uh, the meeting about how many student cube feet would occupy by your class. You know, that's my, one of my favorite administrator terms is student cube feet. That's the cubic feet of the classroom uh, divided by the number of students in the class. And we have standards on that, you know, so, um, <laughs> I, so, you know, I don't know what to do with it, you know, uh, it's so incredibly silly. My my most uh, profitable teaching experiences have been at professional art schools like Otis or or uh, Art Center, Sci Arc. Uh, I had a wonderful class at Harvard, and uh, and as always, they're always glad to see me come and glad to see me go. You know. Were you the longest? Weren't you the longest at UNLV? Yes, I was. Yes, How but I only that? taught at Unit Art for ten years before they threw me out, and then I taught creative writing because um, I couldn't get along with my colleagues. I don't play well with others, and um, so that. Uh, <clears throat> and I had great writers, and I had great artists when I was at UNLV, and I had some very good architects when I was at Harvard. I had some pretty good kids at all the other places that I taught. Because for a long time, I would just take a job for a semester, you know, to coast through the next one. So that makes oh. sense. Tracy, you had a question? Oh. I will ask a question. Dave, first of all, I have been an admirer since The Invisible Dragon and have Thank followed you, you since then. Um, through time with Air Guitar and Pirates and Farmers and your stint with Art in America and UNLV with Libby at the head, helm of the Las Vegas Art Museum. I was in, I've been watching. Um, I'm curious, you know, to an artist that wants to have an impact but doesn't want to really play into what it takes, it in sort of the money empire, but really wants to <clears throat> have their work seen in a quality venue, not in a, not in a venue, but in a, in a place where people can take the work in the way you want it to be taken in. What do you recommend? What, you know, how do we get there? What I is our mecca? <laughs> uh, I have proposed a number of places that an apt city project would be to take a block of storefronts and turn it all into galleries and sublet it. So you can come in and sublet it and show it. And the reason you have to have five or six galleries is that it takes a minimum of five or six places to stop to get anybody to do anything art related. Uh, I know that in Vegas, you know, there was a gallery, there was the museum, we desperately needed a third institution, and uh, we got one, but it drove all the other institutions out of business, you know? Awesome. And uh, it's like the Dallas Museum of Fine Arts is built over the, over the land that once housed all the artist studios in town, so everybody moved. Are we still listening? Yep. Okay. Did I lose you, Tracy? No, I'm with you. Okay. So, you know, it's like, 
when the museum destroys the artists and destroys the galleries and the university does that too, that ain't helping, you know? Uh, and then you build museums. Why do you do that? Because there are no artists on your board. There are plumbing contractors on your board. There are real estate people on your board. They're going to build out this beautiful edifice in which you, I don't know, show somebody terrible. Um, well, I, I see all the problems. I'm looking for solutions. I understand. Okay. <laughs> uh, I just theoretically, I think what has to be done, uh, you take your model from rock and roll. Uh, what happened in Seattle is that they worked for their own community. They had four or five pretty good bands and they played Seattle until they were blue in the face, until they could support themselves out of Seattle to take it on the road. Same thing happened with Prince at Minneapolis that's, uh, is that you've got to start at home and build out from there. And uh, that means you have to talk to local car dealers, I know, uh, but you have to do it. It's not like it's any nicer in New York. You know, I mean, so we live in a, right now in an extremely cruel world, I think, for my standards. Uh, I, I think, you know, I think your job is to make art. Your job is not to sell it. You're not your dealer. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And uh, you don't have to have a boob job to sell a painting. You know, it's just as simple as that. Thank and, God. <laughs> but uh, we do have a situation now where everything is getting eaten up by the mainstream so that nothing looks like art. And the less it looks like art, the more we like it. Yeah. Uh, whereas I would recommend Robert Gober's show, uh, where is it, that, that MoMA, over yeah. almost anything I've seen in 10 or 12 years. Uh, it's not that there's no bad art being made. It's not being written about. It's not being talked about. There are no intellectual venues in which serious discussion goes on among educated people. And, um, <clears throat> and so... That's what's gone. So would I write a review for $50 for Art Forum? On the moon, you know? Uh, would they ever publish a good, good review in Art Forum? No, because the guys who are writing it are trying to get tenure. And you do not get tenure by stating strong opinions. You understand? You just list all the theoreticians you've ever... Uh, you've ever heard of and let it go at that well we don't want you to write off the art world we want you to keep writing well i'll keep i'm a writer and again <laughs> my plan with the art world is whatever i get some money together i go to new york i stay in a midtown hotel i get a limo i go look at art i come back do it for two days get on the plane and go home i don't see anybody i don't talk to anybody i just go look at the art and the art keeps my counsel. And, uh, you know, I'm an art person. There's not many art people around. Uh, and, uh, and, and I, I have uh, artists and critic acquaintances who are serious people. But, uh, you know, I've been in the... Uh, in the public arena for a long time and it has become so catastrophically corporate you know the whole of new york city looks like some gay guy's apartment if they've got it all so prissed up you can't even spit on the street you know it's like what's going on i don't know uh, i don't i don't understand the prettification of everything uh but probably I shouldn't. I'm an old guy. And, uh, you know, 
Nobody gets drunk. Nobody gets high. Nobody gets laid. Everybody worries about how much their Yves Saint Laurent shoes are killing them. That's all they, you know, those ones with the little braces around the ankles. Um, and, and how do you know that stuff? Dave, I'm in Montana. We don't have those things. Oh, uh, you don't have any black people either. <laughs> Let me interrupt and segue over to Sam. Hi, Sam. Go ahead. You're on your end. Hi there. Hi, Dave. Um, wow, what a treat to hear from you. Um, I have a question. From the point of view of an art critic, what is your approach to, um, like, how do you decide upon who you're going to write about? whether it hits you bad or in a good way. Like, what it ha what I if I have something to say, I'll try to say it. Yeah. Um, but being a critic, because I am an evaluative critic, I mean, I could say if it's good or bad. Yeah. But that, you know, and that in the long run, and so I take the jobs that pay the best about the best artists and that I can find. It could be young artists or old artist or any kind of artist, um, there is no, uh, I have absolutely no logic. I just take it as it comes. Right. I can't imagine calling people and say, hey, can I write about Richard Prince? You know, I mean, that's stupid. Um, right. would be yeah, cheap. so you just, you're just moved whenever it hit, if you see, whether it's good or bad art, you'll, you'll write about it. There's well, no, no I, if it's bad art, I probably won't. And, uh, Right. Because uh, the company of bad artists hurts you, hurts them, hurts everybody. That's one of the problems with teaching at a school. You're walking down the hall with all of these professors who don't make very good art, and they give you this look. It's like, and um, what that means is you could help me, but you won't. And yeah. so you attract a lot of resentment in academic environments, you know. Right. And so I don't consort with bad artists. Right. And is it clear to you what is good and bad art? Like, I haven't read your Pirates and Farmers. I just ordered the books. Yeah, I just, it's, clear, it's pretty clear to me. Yeah. And um, would you be able the, to tell uh, us now what? Hmm? Would you be able to say now what are some, what your criterion is? Like, no, I'm just waiting for the next big thing. Uh, give you a good idea. Like, I was a child of the factory. Right. I really appreciate a lot of the things things Jeff Koons does. I think his art is horrible. I do not like surrealism or that tradition, but I really like Bob Dober, who has all of those things. So mm -hmm. you just look at it, see where try to see where the heart is, or if there's anything there that's got some energy to it. I don't much think about it, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. It's like uh, Leo Costello used to say, you know, if you wait until everybody knows it, you've just lost a whole lot of money. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, so, yeah. So, so taking chances is where it, where it comes from. Right. Huh. So are there, are there many dealers? Um, like, are there, there are very few of you, obviously, um, of your quality and ilk. But do you see a new um, world of art dealers who are kind of along the same? Kind of I am sure art? they are there, but yeah. I'm not enough in the art world to have met them. Yeah. Almost a great many of my best friends when I came into the art world were dealers, so Leo Costelli and Sidney Jennison, uh, all those people. Now, and they told me most of the good stuff that I know. Anything I know about a princess, I heard from an art dealer, okay? So um, a princess of anything. And uh, But at the same time, that can all go away in a flash. Right. You know, uh, that, that is, you know, an art dealer dies, there's not a ripple. Uh, an art critic dies, there's not a ripple. It just, you know, you're just part of the big ocean. And uh, that's fine with me. Uh, but the, the problem I have is like, what does the art world offer 
that I want. You know what I mean? Yeah. Now, used to, just going to New York and having a lunch at La Pleiade with Leo, that was great. Going down to the factory, that was great. Oh, you know, going to Max's, that was great. Uh, now I'm happy to sit on the 20th floor at the war until I get my car and go look at art. Right, you know? uh, I mean, I know a lot of people, but there's not many people I won't see. Right. And, uh, and you just cannot go into this thinking you're going to make money, you know, no. because very few people do. Why right. would the art world is the most frivolous, unfair, dangerous, cruel place in the world? Why would you expect it to be fair? You know, there's no fair court. <laughs> You know? <laughs> so, uh, right. I guess I never really thought of it as being a fair ground. I see it more of as like a gladiator sport, you know? Well, it, it, I, I think it's very serious, you know? Yeah. I mean, uh, that is, uh, you know, I, I, I'm sort of on Richard Serra's side. It's a vocation, you know? And, uh, and you can't be a sissy, you know? And so that's... Uh, and you have to work real hard, you know, yeah. Yeah. because uh, back in the, you know, uh, late 60s, early 70s, Richard would bankrupt himself every time he did a show just to buy the materials. And yeah, so, yeah. I mean, he's making a million dollars now, but I don't think it's improved anything. He's a wonderful artist. Yeah. Well, and also his deal, wasn't it Leo Castelli who just believed in them and just was able to tell him you know yeah leo and bruce now uh, yeah. richard and bruce nauman and a number of people who have survived uh, right. were under leo's tutelage and yeah. uh, i like leo because he was very shallow he liked art and he liked women and that's all he would talk about <laughs> <laughs> he was special yeah. cynthia go ahead hey thank, thank you. you thank you hi dave Hi, uh, where are you, Cynthia? There you are. I'm good. I have a question. I'm just philosophically wondering if you think that the state of the art world as it is now, you believe that it will eventually fall in on itself? Because I have experienced, uh, actually in, a, in Bushwick, um, a gathering of like 80, 90 painters that show up and stop <laughs> the meaning of painting and why it's important and all kinds of discussions like this, not a lot, but like, you know, at least three or four times a year. And I'm just kind of wondering if you think that things will, will come, will crash in all the commercial eventually, maybe even because of the economy and that there'll be a resurgence of pockets of people that really do believe in art for the right reasons? Well, I think that looking at art as the kind of discourse as it is, right. art at best should be have the status of jazz uh, in our culture, which is not very big, not very small. It's a discourse of adepts people who go to see jazz because they are adepts in their knowledge of it. Now that's the natural format for an art world. Um, now for many years, we have regarded art as a refuge for capital, you know, where you can hide money. And uh, certainly that was true in the early eighties when, uh, you know, half the cocaine in South America went into buying Julian Schnabel. But, uh, some of it got blown up. Uh, <laughs> so, but I don't think, all right, let me, let me give you an example. Uh, all these people are flipping and buying very young artists right now for outrageous prices and not very good artists, sort of slow pitch um, Latin American expressionism or whatever you want to call it. Uh, now, Buying young artists is like buying an IPO, an initial public offering, right? And 
do you buy it or don't buy it? Well, you really ought to know something about it because all you want is five years of this artist holding its price and you're free, you know, basically. Uh, you've got a valuable work of art. Um, I think five or six years from now, we're going to reap the consequences of all this stupid hedge fund money going to stupid art, you know, and uh, then we'll see, you know, then we'll see if this, the, the world, this world will hold up. Um, I have a lot of respect for people, the number of people in this world, but at the same time, it's, okay, I got an invitation the other day from Berlin to an exhibition of a German photographer. There was no picture on it. There was no text on it. There was just the guest list. <laughs> 40 people, artists showing here, guest list for the opening. And that was all. And that pretty much, you know, sums it up for me. Uh, I'm not going to be there. But the social stuff is very important to people. You know, um, I, uh, I mean, I had a, I got an invitation to, uh, what, Jeff Kuhn's birthday party. Okay. And I threw it into the round file and went on. And then I was in New York and I mentioned this. And one of the women at the table burst into tears. I could have given that to her. She could have gone to the party. Everything would be perfect, but I threw it away. So that, and this is someone who is a very astute person in the art world who discovered Matthew Barney and, and a number of other people. So, uh, I, you know, their virtues, their, you know, their, you know, switches that aren't flipped in my head, you know, the social part is not flipped. The, uh, Thrift shop stuff is not flipped. The yard sale stuff is not flipped. I don't know anything about all of that. But uh, so I just try to find art I can write about, you know. It's not a particularly, uh, it's really easy. If you know how to write, it's really easy. If it's, what you're doing is not easy, you shouldn't do it. I mean, it takes a lot of work, of course, and you want to be good, of course, but it's really easy. Art is easy. All the artists I know do things very easily, you know? Um, yeah, it, I was just having, I had one more thought because I remember yeah. a long time ago, um, I guess Tolstoy wrote this book called What is Art? And one of the things that he's, I think he was talking about, which is kind of like reminding me of what you're saying was that rich people, would cause artists to do more novel kind of work rather than the work that they were feeling coming from their souls. They were always reinventing in order to please the wealthy people. <laughs> and it kind of is continuing, you know? Yeah, but there's really more pressure to not change than there is pressure to change. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that is, uh, Julian spent like three years making plate paintings because they were real famous. He was totally through with plate paintings, and uh, which is sad because that's been the last good work he's ever done. But uh, at the same time, there's a lot of pressure not to change, not to destroy the trademark, you know? I think songwriters uh, have that too. Huh? A lot of songwriters, they have this. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I was a songwriter for a long time, I know. Yeah. We used to have a rule is that you either wrote for a session tomorrow, so you wrote something that looked like the charts, or you wrote for six weeks later, and then you wrote something that didn't sound like the charts. Whose art do you like today, Dave? Huh? Whose art do you like today? I like Robert Gober. I've always liked Have Ellsworth. you always liked Gober, or have you come to him lately? Huh? Have you always no, liked I'm, I'm, I've liked Gober forever, and... Uh, He's a very bright man. I wrote the big catalog text for his big Dia show, and uh, and I have uh, written for him. He did a Charles Birchfield show that was very beautiful. I wrote the catalog for that, 
And Bob and I get along fine. I think he's a good guy. He's the first really square gay guy I've ever known. <laughs> right. I'm used to people with feathers in their hair, you know, so. But uh, Robert's serious, you know. Yes. Okay. Um, Michael, you seem to, people seem to be attributing a question to you. Do you have something you want to say, Michael? Uh, well, I, I put my hand up and then I put it down. But I'm just kind of, I'm really enjoying this. Um, yeah. The one thing I thought with a lot of the, like real estate developers in Vancouver, I know a few people, people with a lot of money start buying art, which is great for artists, but then they start building these private sort of gallery museums and have exclusive showings and they, they end up, you can create value around anything by having wealth to begin with. So I, I find that that's what the art world keeps showing us is you can create values and sustain value, create the illusion of value and it somehow sticks when there's money behind it. So it's it the art world negates a lot of people and i think when you talk about different villages paul there's the the village that has the tower sticking way up high with the terraced garden up top there's a little That's party going that where you live no I, <laughs> i'm on the second floor but i'm above a carpet shop right now um, but i just find like there's there's different villages but some villages are ivory towers so well my rule is it takes a village to make bad art um <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm alone up here pretty much so that's good yeah. yeah stay away from those weird people that all went to high school together I, every time I go to Vancouver I have to go up with somebody and everybody we went to high hey, school come and, on over to my place I'm in Vancouver too <laughs> that's funny well the good thing about you were talking yes money can create value yeah. but as we used to have a saying in rock and roll he says, give me enough styrofoam and duct tape, I can yeah. conquer the world. You know, yeah. setting up shows all the time. Yeah. The problem is you can't hold it. <laughs> you know, it's just like, you can conquer it, but you can't really keep it. It's only styrofoam and duct tape. And, and, right. uh, and uh, fancy hors d'oeuvres serve about the same function. Mm -hmm. they, they will get you the attention. It just will not last. Mm -hmm. if the work is not interesting if what you're selling is not interesting i'll go to your party i'll eat your weird weird hors d'oeuvres from uruguay or whatever it is they're serving but uh i don't uh but it won't last you know, <laughs> yeah. i used to uh one of the assignments i gave my kids was to go back and select a gear of art forum magazines anywhere between 1974 and now and read the whole year and see if there was anybody there that you've ever heard of since. Yeah. This Rodney Allen Greenblatt looked like he's really coming on. That Meyer Weissman, oh man, he's the future. Where are they now? I can pull up an image. Jed Garrett. We can keep no going. Oh shit. <laughs> I actually saw a Jed Garrett catalog. In a, in a book bin for 25 cents, and I really <laughs> couldn't go that way. Um, uh, but I, Jed was a very beautiful boy, and that helps a lot in the art world. Some of these people are still making good art, though. Gary yeah. Stephan is. Yeah, that's true. But Gary went a little crazy for a while. No, I'm a supporter of his art. I like him. Uh, hey, Sarah, did you want to say more? Did I cut you off? Today? Thank you. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I was just thinking about still just thinking about the teaching thing and we're talking about bad art and there's a lot of bad art out there and and I'm just I guess I'm wondering without without the the teachers and the the teachers who are passionate about giving it back and and who are good at it and and I think that there are then what's going to happen to craft and foundations and and, and how, and even though I, I think, and in the 10 years that I've been teaching, I've noticed that we have an increase in information availability through the internet. You can learn anything on the internet, but somehow all of my students seem to be going backwards. It's like there's more hand-holding than ever now, even though there's more information out there. So, so I think like any argument that, well, all the information's already out there, we don't need teachers does it isn't doesn't really apply because people don't they don't access that information so I, I guess I'm wondering what's gonna happen we're gonna end up with idiocracy yeah 
uh, I think that's pretty much what we have. Look at Congress, you know. Uh, yeah, watch the elections tomorrow. Uh, uh, I'm scared. <laughs> uh, no, I, I have, uh, I really do think there's been a massive decline in, not in the intelligence, but just in the knowledgeability of your average citizen. I really think it's been knocked down a stake or two. And uh, certainly the students that my wife, my wife teaches at uh, uh, the University of New Mexico, and uh, they're just, you know, she does her best, you know. Uh, but, you know, you can't teach the students to spell the name of the artist they're writing their essay about, you know. So it's a, can't tell you the versions of Michelangelo she's collected. Um, but, it, it's you know, it's stupid, you know. We're about to become a banana republic. And uh, I don't uh, look forward to that, of course, but I don't have to look forward to as much as you guys do. So, <laughs> I mean, I had a great deal of fun when I was having fun. You still like it look like you're having fun. Well, not really, but uh, I'm working. You know, I like to write. And uh, I started this Facebook thing because I, I, I usually write all day. And for a while there, I didn't have stuff to write all day. And uh, uh, so I started doing Facebook, and I thought it was going to be fun. It wasn't. And it isn't. It gets to be a job. Well, and, no, I write something every once in a while. I, I put some little Bob Irwin pictures up today and things like that. But um, uh, I don't think that uh, people aren't coming to it in a serious way. I mean, you know, they don't address my statuses as, an adu as adults might, you know. They're either smart off kids or they're suck off, and that's about it. Nobody will just presume that we're equals here on the planet and write something straight ahead, you know. And so I can't do anything about that. I guess I guess what I'm wondering is, as a a teacher and an artist, what what do we what do we do? What what I'm here? I'm going to tell you something for me that really gets on my nerves. Poorly built stretchers, for example. I can't stand it. I can't stand looking at crappy canvases that are warped and poorly stretched and not built well. And so if there isn't a, a, a someone to, to provide that skill, then what happens? Where's, you know, the, the educational breakdown you know, I mean, what, what, what do I do? You know, how do I, how do I keep it going? I guess. Right. I understand. I, a good fight. I will admit the first time I saw a big Frank Stella in a gallery, I immediately went down to Santini to see how they built the stretchers, you know, uh, which it was down on Mercer. And uh, at the same time, Mary Heilman has built a career on wonky stretchers. You know, <laughs> her paintings all warp out at the corner or bend in, and it's that's her little Peter Volkus thing. It goes, but, uh, with, it goes with her art, her imagery though too. You know, Stella doing that would sort of destroy it. Yeah, well, Stella destroyed himself, and uh, but he was good when he was good, uh, and uh, you know, it, it it doesn't hurt to go to a fancy school. So, um, but I'm not, uh, I mean, that's one of the things that probably I know that you don't. Uh, I went to New York, uh, 69, 70 to run the Reese Pally Gallery, which was down there across from Finelli's. And the first thing I discovered is that all of the artists in the gallery had a million times more money than I could ever imagine. They had giant lofts, they had special elevators, they had everything, because most artists that succeed are rich. Now, me and Bob Rosenberg were not rich, but we worked real hard, you know? And uh, and a lot of, Andy wasn't, well, Andy was pretty rich when he started being an artist. Um, 
he was the most famous commercial illustrator in the world. So I don't have a, I don't think you can afford it. Now, there are artists out there who make marvelous work. Uh, there's a woman named Max Cole up in Northern, uh, Northern California who makes these beautiful sort of ochre Bridget Riley's that are just to die for. And she sells them, but you'll never hear from her because her name sounds like a guy and because she lives in Northern California and, uh, and because she doesn't suffer fools gladly. So that's fine. But uh, I think that, uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't know how you do it. This You've got to find an alternative way to do it. And I don't know what that is, you know. Uh, I know I taught off and on throughout the 80s, and the only thing I can tell you for sure is my students kept getting shorter and shorter. You know, I mean, in height, you know. And um, I don't know what that means, but it was true. Uh, were they coming from a different continent? Well, there, this is L.A., when I taught in Vegas, everybody was tall, and we looked like an intramural b basketball team. But uh, I, uh, I will tell you what I found works in teaching practicing artists is first abolish the group crit. The group crit is just an occasion for people to blow off steam and suck up and preen and prance. So don't do that. You know, and those are ridiculous. What? Those are ridiculous. You're right. They're ridiculous. They're destructive. Yeah, they are mean. And they allow the professor to hierarchize the class, and they hurt people's feelings to no one. And the worst thing is, if you make the best art, you get the least commentary. Everybody looks at it and says, "Oh, do some more of those." Then some idiot comes up with a piece of plywood with the word boogie scratched into it, and everybody talks for 15 years, you know. Uh, so I just stopped that, and I stopped uh, recruiting students who were not from major metropolises. If they weren't from Shanghai or London or, or Vancouver or, you know, if they weren't for some big city, New York, Miami, I just didn't recruit them you know, because art scares those people. And uh, so uh, you don't want to get people down there, you know, in culture shock, you know, this is Vegas. And, um, but that worked, you know. Uh, so I tried to, uh, by abolishing group crits, recruiting kids from good schools in good cities, and by just making it very clear, I used to say, if you need me, I will come. But if you are not sick, do not call the doctor. Okay? <laughs> that is, unless you have, if you just want confirmation of your cuteness or something, <laughs> fuck it, you know? Uh, so, and that really helped. Uh, it was uh, benign neglect, I guess, would be this. <laughs> so... And it works fairly well. And uh, also, you know, students do bond. They do create little communities. And, and sometimes they are very, very good and very helpful. Wonderful. I think it's time to wrap this up. Thank um, you so much. I really appreciate that. That was really helpful. I just oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank I you really, too, Sarah. That was really awesome. Thank you. Thank you, guys. So, David, I really appreciate, you know, all you give to the art world and, you know, your contribution in it and your role and, you know, the insider, outsider perspective. I think it's been really great. Let me unmute everybody. All right. Thank you so much. We will be in touch. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. 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 Thank